Hey guys, I'm Carl Bainbridge and welcome back to INC Live and welcome to our review of UFC Fight Night Blades vs Lewis. I've just got around to watching the card, with that being said, let's get to the fights. And the only place we can start is in our main event where Derek Lewis beat Curtis Blades by second round knockout and in doing so extended his record for the most knockout wins in UFC heavyweight history. I have to start this by owing some of my subscribers an apology because I run polls on the main INC channel asking people to pick winners for title fights and fight night main events. And they had Derek Lewis winning this one 55% to 45. Now part of me wrote this off as people voting for who they want to win rather than who they thought would win. And I have to be honest, those people know a hell of a lot more than me. I expected Curtis Blades to take this one comfortably. I've never seen great takedown defense from Derek Lewis in the past. And I thought that once Blades got him down, we would basically see something similar to what we did against Alistair Overeem. Just blades, ground and pounding him, and Derek being finished on the ground. The selling point of this fight was, could Derek land that big punch before Curtis took him down? And that's essentially what happened. But for me, the tone was set in those first 30 seconds of the match, because Curtis shot him for a takedown, and Derek nearly timed that uppercut during that first takedown attempt. And I think from that point on, Curtis seemed very hesitant when shooting in. I think he only went for two more, which was one where early in the second round, he failed to get Derek down, and the other time was when he was knocked out. It forced him to strike with Derek Lewis. And I have to be honest, Curtis Blades gets a lot of ridicule for his striking, but I don't think he did too badly in those first round striking exchanges. He was giving Derek some trouble with his hands. Uh, his jab looked very good. He had Derek up against the fence a couple of times. I know Derek likes this idea of sort of luring people into a false sense of security and making them charge in. He did that against JDS. But I think he was having issues with Curtis Blades' jab. But it's still very evident this side of his game isn't up to par with his wrestling, which I think is a real shame. Like, Daniel Cormier is one of the best wrestlers this sport's ever seen. And even he realised he needed to have a striking game if he wanted to beat the top-level heavyweight fighters. Because the threat of the takedowns would set up the hands, and also, it would do something that Rashad Evans pointed out when he was talking about Curtis Blades. Having those hands helps to create a distraction so you can shoot him for the takedown without the opponent realizing. Because Curtis doesn't have that, his takedown attempts are naked. Everyone knows when they're coming. And that's what happened with Derek Lewis. He timed that, ta he timed that takedown to absolute perfection, got the uppercut, and that was a bad one as well. Because if you watch the replay of that, you can see Curtis Blades' body sort of jolts up and then stiffens when Derek makes contact. That is one of the hardest knockouts that you can come across, especially from a guy like Derek Lewis, who we know can absolutely crack. The one thing I hope that comes from this is people start taking Derek Lewis a lot more seriously. People think because of his Instagram feed, all the funny interviews, all the jokes on Twitter, YouTube, etc., He's a bit of a meme fighter. Even when he was on that great winning streak a couple of years ago and he fought DC for the belt, people treated him fighting for the title as a joke. And I've always been a bit more defensive of Derek. I think the guy is a much better athlete than people give him credit for. I mean, you don't, you don't throw a jumping switch kick at 260 pounds without being a great athlete. And I think there's a lot more technique to him than that sort of wild brawler persona that people make him out to be. That was a well-timed knockdown. You don't do something like that without having some sort of nout about you. Now, I'm not going to say that Derek Lewis is going to be a world champion or anything like that. But that fight, if you want to borrow sort of a music analogy, that fight was his rubber sole. That was the moment people realised there was a lot more legitimacy to this guy than we first thought. There's going to be questions over who he's going to fight next. I'm hearing like the Royce and Strike vs. Garn winner. Of course, that's the next main event that's coming up. That could be in the reckoning. He called out Alistair Overeem, which I'm not entirely sure whether he was serious about that. Honestly, if the UFC wanted to, I wouldn't be against the idea of him versus John Jones. A sort of litmus test to see if John can handle those sort of big top level heavyweight fighters. And if John was to get through that, you've got two big paydays because he would fight the Stipe versus Francis winner. I think they're going to put John into that title fight straight away, which I understand from the UFC's perspective, but Derek Lewis is a lot more going for him than people make him out to be. And I hope that this performance makes people realise that. 
On the whole, it was a big night for the heavyweights in general. Chris Dawkins and Tom Aspinall getting big wins over some established names. And even though Dawkins got the bigger win in terms of rankings, Olenek obviously being, I think, 10th in the world, I was more impressed by Tom. Now, Andrei Olovsky in his later run has sort of become this wily fighter. He capitalizes on the youth and the inexperience of some of his opponents. We saw, saw that when he fought Kanaboza. Tom answered those questions regarding grappling, conditioning, which there were some of those considering the way he'd been blowing through his first two UFC opponents. Submitting Andrei Olovsky is no easy task. I think he's only ever been once before, which I think was Josh Barnett back in, I think, around 2016, Barnett submitted him. So doing that is puts Tom in very exclusive company. A lot of people think when it comes to British fighters, they only know how to strike, and that's always sort of been a stigma that us Brits have had to live with. But I think he showed some good grappling acumen. I'm interested to see where they go with Tom Aspinall. Now, I'm not going to say he's going to be a lock to be a future champion, but considering how young he is and what we've seen in terms of hand speed, footwork, and now the grappling, there is a lot of upside to this guy. It might be a bit predictable to say, but I think him versus JDS could make a lot of sense. Maybe someone like Augusto Sakai. He's worthy of a top 10 opponent based on what we saw against Arlovsky because finishing Andre Arlovsky is, even in this later stage of his career, the only people who've been doing that recently is sort of Stipe, Francis Ngannou, and Royce Strike. So he's in very exclusive company. Uh, it was a good showing as well for Dorcas, but I think for me it was more of a sign that Olenek isn't that sort of top 10 elite level fighter anymore. I mean, I love watching the guy, and when he's on the ground, he can be amazing and unpredictable to watch. But he's showing his age with the striking. If he can't get you down, he's very vulnerable. And it's sad to say, maybe you should be considering, hey, maybe calling it a day, but I would much rather have fighters uh, end their career too early rather than too late, which is something I fear with Olenek, considering how badly he's been knocked out the past couple of fights. In all though, I think this was one of the better fight nights for... In all though, I think this was one of the better fight nights in recent months. I fought Erosa versus Landwehr. I expected a lot from that fight, even though it was one round, I think we got our value for money. Uh, Mina and Rosa had some great jiu-jitsu scrambles, which I always love seeing because everyone focuses on the flashy knockouts. But when you get two guys showing some elite level grappling, it can be a joy to watch. And I think this was an example of it. Um, Castaneda recovered well to finish Eddie Wineland. I think Eddie was doing very well in that first round. It's very evident, though, that Eddie's chin is on the decline. And it's, it's sad to see, considering I loved what he was doing in the WEC. And, of course, being a top guy at Bantamweight during its early years in the UFC. Honestly, I would say, outside the core main, I think every fight at least had something worth talking about. And when you bear in mind that we lost Drakkar Closer versus uh, Luis Pena, and then there was the stuff with uh, Jamal Emmers and Chad Skelly, which was bizarre to watch when it was happening live. I think this was a very strong card, and it could have been a lot better had those two fights taken place. I hope everybody involved in those four fights all get better. People are going to ask what's next for Derek Lewis. As I mentioned before, I think Royce Strike and Cyril Garn's winner is potentially going to be his next opponent. Appropriately, that's going to be our next fight night post-mortem. I hope that you join us for that one. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm wanting to try and get better when it comes to this channel. So any sort of feedback in terms of how I present, in terms of production values, will all be greatly appreciated. We've got a lot of plans coming up for this live side of the channel. I hope that you can be there to support us through Thick and Thin. My name's been Carl Bainbridge. This has been the INC. Thank you for watching.